Good afternoon. My name is Ann Baldwin, and I am the Career Tech and College Readiness Coordinator for Westerville City Schools. And thank you for joining us this afternoon for this parent prep session. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. We are, or I am still learning this virtual platform. So please, I ask for your flexibility this afternoon as we navigate this platform. This session will be recorded and available for future use or for those who are unavailable to join us live. During the session, you will only be able to see me as the presenter and my slides. You won't be able to see anyone else's face or anyone else speaking that's a part of today's webinar. However, there is a way to send us questions and communicate with us. And today I have Kristen Robertson with Westerville Education Challenge, a sponsor of Parent Prep, who will be helping me manage the Q&A session and make sure that we answer your questions along the way. If you do have a question today, click on the Q&A feature, the, probably the bottom of your screen, and then you'll have a chance to send us a question either with your name that you logged in with or as an anonymous person as well. Please note though, when we answer your question, it will show up to other participants in the webinar. So I think we are ready to go ahead and get started. So I'm excited this afternoon to share information and tips with you about college readiness assessments that will help guide you and your student in post-secondary planning. And I'm really intentional about that word guide. These scores don't dictate your path. An ACT or SAT score is a snapshot of your progress at one point in time on a Saturday or during SAT school session and is one component of your application process. There are competitive programs out there that require a certain threshold or score in order to move forward, but there are lots of programs that are a fantastic fit for every student. And we'll talk a little bit about today on how to find those best fits. I'm gonna focus this afternoon primarily on the PSAT and SAT because these are two assessments that we offer for students in Westerville City Schools at no cost. The PSAT is typically given in the fall each year. And this year, because of COVID, the College Board has offered two sessions of the PSAT, one on the original date in October and another in January. Westerville is moving forward with the January 26th administration date and this test will be available to all juniors in the district and sophomore students interested in taking the PSAT can opt in. You will be receiving more information from your high schools about that if you are a sophomore or junior. The SAT is scheduled to be administered in Westerville State Schools on March 3rd, 2021, and all of our juniors will sit for that assessment. It is administered to the class of 2022 at no cost. It is legislated by the state of Ohio that school districts offer juniors an opportunity to take a college admissions or readiness assessment. It can lead, your score can lead to earning a seal for graduation, one of two seals that are required for graduation. And it is also an opportunity to really gauge where you are and maybe even participate in College Credit Plus as an upperclassman. Our district has chosen the SAT. We have the option to choose ACT or SAA. We've chosen SAT because it aligns with the assessments that our students take in Westerville already. The PSAT, our juniors take for a practice tests, but it's also part of the National Merit Scholarship Competition, as well as AP tests that our students take. Those are all aligned and under the College Board. And by offering the SAT, we were able to really help students focus their practice and be ready for that particular assessment. One question I often get asked is when is the best time to take a college readiness assessment? And you notice that the PSAT and SAT are geared towards juniors. And often for most students, you'll take your college readiness assessment your junior year, because at that time you're enrolled or you've already taken Algebra 2, which is a course we recommend you having before you take one of these assessments. You've also had college preparatory curriculum that helps you be prepared for these tests. Doesn't mean you can't take it earlier, you certainly can. We do have students, particularly gifted students that are invited to take the SAT or ACT in middle school. And you might get an email or a letter from our gifted department about new maps offering a testing experience for students at the middle level. This allows students to participate in different 
programming, gifted programming that's available. It doesn't hurt to take the test earlier. It's just you may not have the experience or the curriculum that gives you a, a gauge of really where you are in the route to being college ready because those tests are normed for students at the junior level. We start talking about the PSAT. And for each test, we'll go through quickly the anatomy of the test and then talk a little bit more about scoring and what is a good score. And then finally wrap up with some resources and preparing for these assessments. The PSAT I mentioned is given to our juniors in the fall and it is a two hour and 45 minute test. There are two sections and this is a practice SAT. So it mirrors the SAT that students will take later. Evidence-based reading and writing and math. On the math section of the test, there is a section where you will use a calculator and where you will not use a calculator. It is rights only scoring. And this is a change to the SAT recently in the past couple of years that there is no penalty for guessing. So we recommend that students do go through and answer every question. And there's a greater emphasis on this SAT of not merely just defining words, but be able to understand meaning of words in extended context and how word choice shapes meaning. For the PSAT, you can request accommodations. If you have a 504 IEP, you will work with your intervention specialist and school counselor request those accommodations. You actually request them through the college board and those accommodations may be different than what you experience in your classroom. Oftentimes accommodations on the PSAT or SAT or even ACT are extended time and additional breaks. Once the really neat thing about us having this aligned system with the PSAT and SAT and AP in our district is once you apply and are approved for accommodations with the PSAT that carries over to the SAT and ACT. When, after you take the PSAT, you will get a report, score report back. And oftentimes counselors will call down students for an assembly to explain the score reports and scores. You get a copy of your test booklet so you can see what questions you answered correctly and incorrectly. You get detailed section reports. You get an overall score and you will see what percentile you've scored in. This sample report here, you see the student scored a 960 on the PSAT and scored in the 51st percentile. That means that student scored at or better than 51% of students who took the test. So they're about in the middle. Then we'll see section scores for evidence-based reading and writing and math and the percentile for each of those scores. And then down below, you've got the red, green, yellow benchmarking score that gives you a quick glance of where you are as far as meeting college readiness benchmarks. And when you take the PSAT, the college readiness benchmark is set that you are projected to meet the benchmark set for the SAT that indicate that you are college ready and that you are 75% likely to get a C or higher in a entry level college course or 50% chance of getting a B or higher in that course. And that's after lots of research of SAT scores and grades in college and how those correlate. Again, this gives you an indication as a junior, even as a sophomore, when you take this on where you are and helps you maybe set goals for practice and what coursework you wanna take in high school so that you can improve those scores to meet whatever goals you set for yourself. With the PSAT, you also receive information about AP potential. And with that alignment and AP, AP classes, you're able to see if your score aligns, maybe that gives a good indication that you'd be successful in a particular AP score. So it may open up some doors or possibilities that you weren't even thinking of before. There are also scholarships opportunities tied to the PSAT for juniors taking the test. For juniors taking the test, you are a part of the National Merit Scholarship competition. And that scoring will take your section scores and create an index score. And if you are in the top generally 3% of students that tested that year, you may be awarded as National Merit Scholarship finalist. And that may mean scholarship monies, maybe even a free ride to a college or university. 
One of the neat things about taking the PSAT too is that you have opportunity to link your scores with the Khan Academy and develop a personalized plan for preparing for the SAT. When you link your scores, you're able, Khan Academy is able to design a practice for you that's based on what areas of growth you really need to focus on. So we recommend students taking the time, looking at that score report and then diving into Khan Academy before they take the SAT in the spring so that they are the most prepared that they can be. When you get that report, you will have a chance to set up your college board account. And we have a recommended username and password that you use to set up that account because it is gonna be an account that you use throughout your high school career. You start out in your sophomore year at the PSAT, you'll add to that account with your SAT as a junior and your AP scores when you take AP classes and test. This will also be the account where you send your official scores to a college or university. So you wanna make sure that you set it up and use that same account throughout your entire high school career. If you sign up maybe as a sophomore, not thinking, and then junior year, you have your SAT, and now you want to send your scores and you set up a different account, you may have missing scores in there. And it's a little harder than to call the college board and work all of that out. So we recommend that when you set up your account that you use your first initial last name and your student ID number, something that you're really familiar with. And then for your password, use your current Westerville login password and add a special character at the end. If you follow this process too, if you're working with your school counselor we can, and you forget, we can have you try this out and chances are you'll be able to get in. Quick look at scoring for the PSAT to give you a sense of where different scores fall in percentiles. A grade level benchmark for the PSAT is a 460 evidence-based reading and writing score. That means a student is on target to earn a college readiness benchmark on SAT, a 510 on the math section. You'll see if you're scoring a 1010 overall on the PSAT as a junior, that's putting you in the 50th percentile in the middle. If you have a score of 1160 or 1290, then your score is certainly more competitive as you go up in those percentiles. The norms are slightly different for sophomores and that's based again on where they are in their high school career and curriculum. So you'll notice the bench, grade level benchmarks are a little lower, 430 for evidence-based reading and writing and 480 for math. In 50th percentile, if you're a sophomore taking the PSAT and you're scoring a 920, you're scoring the 50th percentile of all sophomores taking the test. We're going to move on to talk a little bit about the SAT. You've taken the practice test and now you're ready for the full test. And this test is three hours long. Again, two sections, evidence-based reading and writing and math. In math, there is a section where you will not be allowed to use a calculator and a section where you will use a calculator. There is an optional essay component to the SAT. This is not a required part of the test. And in the test that we administer in the spring to all of our juniors does not include the essay option. Some schools and programs may require the SAT. So as you're doing your college research, you wanna take a look at that. For instance, Ohio University scripts program around journalism may require you to take that as a portion of the SAT. The SAT is also rights only scoring. So you, it will be to your benefit to answer every question on the test. It is free for our juniors that take the test and you don't have to register. We do all of that for our juniors. You just show up on testing day. If you want to retake the test or take the test at another time, there is a cost of $46 or $60 if you include the essay. There are fee waivers available for free and reduced lunch students. And I encourage you to check in with your school counselor about that. The fee waivers will include the cost of the test as well as score sends later on. And the scoring scale for the SAT is 800 per section for a total of 1600. You can register for the test at collegeboard.org. And again, 
if you have accommodations, if you've not set up accommodations with the PSAT, you'll want to make sure you do that for the SAT. And you'll want to do that ahead of time, take the test. It could take up to seven weeks for accommodations to be approved by the college board. So I recommend if you plan on taking the PSAT as a sophomore, working with your school team on that the spring of your freshman year to get processed so you're ready to go in the fall. SAT also has what are called subject tests and those subject tests are very specific high school subjects like history or English that you can take. And it really depends on the college or university if those subject tests are required. If you're applying for an engineering program, they may want you to check out a math and science subject test. Something to keep in mind as you're doing your research around college programs. Your SAT score report will come back looking like this. You'll have your total score highlighted as well as percentile of not only of SATs or students who've taken the SAT, but a nationally representative sample percentile. Section scores are broken out here again between the evidence-based reading and writing and your math score. You'll have a check mark if you met that college readiness benchmark. And on the SAT, it's a 480 for evidence-based reading and writing and 530 for math. Again, that score means that you have a 75% chance of earning a C or higher on an entry-level college course. And it indicates to colleges that you are most likely prepared for college-level coursework. The report will also give you cross-test scores and sub-scores. So you can dig deep, a little deeper into the different sections to maybe see where some areas of strength or some opportunities to grow are. In addition to getting this particular report and you will get it electronically through your college board account, you can submit an application and a check to receive an answer verification service. So on particular administrations of the SAT, you can order a, a question answer service, which will give you a copy of your test, your answers and explanations of whether or not you got the question correct or not. And this may be good if you're really striving for a particular SAT score, you've taken it once, this allows you to really dive in and understand what you might want to study or prepare for, for the next time you take a test. That QAS is $18 and there's going to be a link in this presentation that will get me emailed out to all participants today that you can check that out and see what a test administration is available for that. Quick look at some SAT scores and their percentiles. If you are scoring a 1050, that puts you in the 50th percentile. If you're looking for a more competitive score, you want to be looking at earning 12, scoring a 1210 or 1350 to go up in those percentiles and be more competitive. Last but not least is the ACT. And the ACT often has been a typical college readiness exam, especially in Ohio. And it is, uh, I often ask, should I take the ACT or SAT? We give you the SAT as option in Westerville, should you also take the ACT? And uh, for students who maybe want to try another test and see how they compare, this would be a good option. This test is three hours and 15 minutes. There are four sections to the test. In addition to reading English and math, you, there is a science section to the ACT. There's also an optional writing component. And again, this is, you would choose to take the optional writing essay if your school or program requires it. On the math, another difference between the ACT and SAT besides the science component of the test is that on the math test, the, are able to use a calculator for the entire mathematics section of the test on the ACT. I would encourage if you are college bound and you are able to go ahead and take the ACT in addition to ACT, see where you land on both. You may find that you scored better on one than the other. And the ACT scoring is rights only as well. So you are encouraged to answer every question on the test. 
you are provided STEM and ELA scores on your score report. We'll take a look at that in just a second. The cost for the ACT is 5050 or 6750 if you choose the writing component. Again, with ACT, there are fee waivers available for students and you would contact your school counselor about that. Scoring scale on the ACT is one through 36. And if you wanna register for the ACT, you visit actstudent.org. Uh, thinking about, and I was just on a webinar with ACT and they shared different new things that were coming out in the next year or so. One is remote testing. And there is no timeline on that, but ACT is looking at an option to provide testing at a student's home. Section retesting is also an option coming to ACT in the future, not seeing an exact timeline. And when that is, instead of maybe taking the entire ACT over, if you wanted to maybe just improve your science score, you'll have the ability to just take one section in the future. And ACT's reporting is also gonna be including your super scores. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Again, these are things coming down the pike. There is not an estimated timeline as of today available on ACT's website, but that's something that we're gonna to continue to watch and you'll hear from your school counselors as those new components are rolled out. Your ACT score report will look like this. You will have your composite score listed on the left and then each section score. Your STEM score is gonna be a combination of your math and science score and your English or your ELA will be a combination of English reading and writing. You then are able to see how you compare to other students across the country as well as state with your score. Just like SAT has a question answer service. ACT also has an opportunity for you to request a more in-depth look at your scores and what you answer correctly and incorrectly that you can order at a cost. And the link is gonna be attached to this presentation so you can check that out. SAT has Khan Academy, College Board has Khan Academy as a practice. ACT has recently rolled out ACT Academy, another free opportunity to practice different test scores and practice based on what your scores are. So you can really hone in on those opportunities for growth as you prepare to maybe take the ACT again. Scoring on the ACT to give you an idea of where different scores fall at percentiles, the middle, a middle score is gonna be a 20 on composite on the ACT that will put you in the 53rd percentile. If you're looking to have a more competitive ACT score, you're looking at 24 or 29. So how do your scores connect to the college admissions process? Scores are a part of your application. Some post-secondary institutions are test optional, which means you can choose to share your scores with them. And if you do, they will take that into account in your application review process. If you don't share them, then they're not reviewed. And then other parts of your application, like your GPA and your strength of schedule are going to be viewed and weighted more heavily. Some institutions are, are test blind, and that means that they won't look at anyone's test scores, even if you submit them, that is not a part of their application review process. Some institutions may super score, which means if you take the test multiple times, the SAT, they'll take the best evidence-based reading and writing score you earned and the best math score you earned and use that as your final score that they consider as part of the application process. But there's COVID and lots of changes. And one of those changes has been the lack of testing opportunities for students. Several sites have closed down and many students who have registered to take the SAT or ACT have had their testing sessions canceled. And colleges and universities have realized this and understand this. And many colleges, and I haven't seen one yet that hasn't moved to temp temporarily at least moving to test optional. You know, for the class of 2021, you do not have to submit your test scores. 
students are still encouraged to submit test scores if they have them available and they reflect their ability. And I know sometimes it's nerve wracking deciding on a test optional, should I send them or should I not? And colleges will share that it's going to be up to the student and the family to make that decision. And you may wonder, well, if I don't submit it, is someone going to maybe assume that I'm not submitting it because it's a low score? And colleges are working really hard to make sure that's not the case and, and focusing on equity and really thinking about a student's fit in the college and looking at the other components of your application. So are you taking the most rigorous courses that are available at your high school? And how are you doing in those rigorous courses? Are you excelling and being successful? What do your letters of recommendation say about your strengths and how you might fit into that campus community? What do your essays say and how do you stand out and how will you add to the college community? Those components are going to be what matter most on your college application. Um, there are again, ours, when you look at very competitive schools that have emissions rates of 4%, you are going to need those test scores maybe to stand out or you're gonna to have to meet those minimums to have a likelihood of being accepted. Um, but schools do understand where students are right now and those test scores can be optional. Our students were really fortunate in the spring to be able to take the SAT before schools shut down. Some other school districts, Central Ohio were not, and they were just getting around to testing this fall. So everyone is in a different situation. You can, when you apply to schools, decide to change. So maybe you say you're not going to share your scores. You decide you do want to. Different schools have different processes for that and you'll wanna pay attention to that. Oftentimes, though, if you say you wanna share your scores, or you intend to share your scores and you want to change your mind the other way uh, that they, they may not let you do that so it's just something to really consider and think about before you complete your applications that being said too when you take the sat or act you have the opportunity to send your scores to a college right at that time or you may choose to wait and not send those scores right away just know that if you send your scores later you will most likely pay a fee Typically, it's $12 to send your scores to the college or university. And when you apply, most colleges and universities want those official test scores sent by the College Board or ACT.org. So what is a good score? And uh, that's a question I often get asked as students are planning for college or maybe even preparing to take College Credit Plus courses. And the answer is it's all relative. And students really need to consider what their post-secondary plans are and research those program requirements. There are several tools available to do that, and we're going to talk about a few of these today. SAT Score Research Journal is a worksheet we've put together here in Westerville to help students record their research and really think about their options. College websites are a wealth of information. Naviant Student is a tool we have in our district available for sixth through 12th grade that allows you to research different college opportunities and see how your scores stack up against uh, freshmen that are attending that college or university you're interested in. And then Big Future is a college board product that also provides opportunity for you to research different college admissions, policies, procedures. Before we start talking about those tools and research, one score that I do want students and families to keep in mind are remediation free scores. And this is a, a minimum score that will give you access to college coursework with when you enter college right away. So, and it may give you an opportunity to take College Credit Plus coursework, for instance, at Columbus State. And if you earn remediation free scores on your tests. This would also be a pathway to graduation too. For the class of 2023 and beyond, you need to earn two graduation seals and college ready is one of the seals that are available. If you score remediation free, then you earn that seal. For the ACT, remediation free scores are 18 in English and 22 in reading and a 22 in math. 
for SAT, Evans-based reading and writing benchmark is 480 and math is 530. When you earn that 530 mathematics score or 22 mathematics score and you want to take a math class that will get you into a college level credit bearing course. But if you are interested in the STEM fields or upper level math, you will typically need a higher ACT or SAT score to place directly into that coursework. If you have these scores and you're interested in College Credit Plus programming that's offered in Westerville City Schools, you would be eligible for those classes. So more than just meeting the benchmark, you want to consider to how, what scores you may need to be competitive for a particular program you're interested in. And one way to figure that out is to research the average scores of students who've been admitted to a college or university, and it can provide some guidance on if that institution is a good fit. We've created a quick handout that you can use as you go through, and right now it's really geared towards the SAT, but you can also add your ACT scores on here and research that part of it. As you look, you can record your SAT and your PSAT scores, see how you have grown, thinking about what your post-secondary plan is, because that really is what should ground your thinking about what schools might be a good fit for you. What career path do you wanna follow and what program is gonna help you get there? Then would list the colleges or universities you're interested in and take a look at the 25th percentile of SAT scores of students that are being admitted and the 75th percentile. And that gives you the middle 50% of students that have been admitted to that class. If your SAT score is aligned with the 25th percentile, you may not be as competitive versus if your score is at the 75th percentile, you're scoring at or higher than 75% of the students being admitted. It means that you're generally pretty competitive for that college program. It doesn't mean you're guaranteed that program. There are students who have perfect ACT or SAT scores that may not be admitted into a particular program because again, your score is just one component of your, your profile that schools are looking at to determine whether or not you're a good fit. As you're doing that research, you'll also want to take a look at specific programs and majors that you're interested in because sometimes they may have higher score thresholds than a typical admission, especially if you're looking at maybe engineering programs or STEM programs, they may have higher score thresholds and then a place for notes for any additional program requirements. This is a great activity to do on a rainy weekend day as you're thinking as you're maybe end of sophomore year, junior year to get prepared for your next steps. As you, once you fill out that chart, there's some questions to consider. What is the highest 75th percentile scoring list that may be your goal score that you set for yourself? How does that score compare to what you have earned on the PSAT or SAT? And then keeping in mind what other ways is your profile a strong fit for that college or university that you're interested in beyond just your score. On the bottom of the sheet, I researched the top 10 schools that Westville students have been or who have applied to for the cohorts of 2018 through 2020. So these are our top 10 most applied to colleges or universities in Westerville City Schools and what their middle SAT scores are, just to give you a sense of what score you may be wanting to earn to be competitive for those programs. Again, your score may be on the low end or below that 25th percentile, it doesn't necessarily mean you won't get in. It may mean that's more of a reach school and uh, it may be more difficult to get into. You notice Columbus State Community College does not have percentile listed. They are open admissions. So when you apply to Columbus State Community College, you're admitted and then your scores place you into coursework. If you meet those remediation free benchmark scores, you will place into composition one which is a freshman English course and math 1148, which is a college algebra course. And you're able to start your program there. 
For some students who may not be great test takers, that might be an opportunity to enroll in college coursework there and take advantage of a two plus two program. Columbus State has some fantastic relationships. They've growing one with Otterbein right here in Westerville with Ohio State. You can begin your first two years at Columbus State and then transfer to Ohio State or Otterbein, saving lots of money in the process. There are amazing scholarships. We've had several students in Westerville earn a STEM scholarship with Columbus State, do their first two years there and transfer to Ohio State and are working towards a degree in medicine. Lots of different options for students if testing maybe isn't your strong suit or even if you're not sure what you wanna do, an opportunity to try it out and you can try it out even when you're in high school. It's a benefit of college credit plus and we will have more information on that on our website or you can always ask your school counselor. You can start some college courses while in high school and that adds to your, your strength of application. If you can take those classes and show your success in them, then you show that you're able to do that college work and you'd be a good fit on a college campus. Conversely, if you do poorly in a college class, then that shows that maybe you're not ready for it. And it's an opportunity you wanna take advantage of, but also make sure that you're ready for. And then down at the bottom here, also picked out some highly selective colleges and universities that you really do need a high SAT or ACT score to typically be considered for admission because their admissions process is so selective. We can take a look at those there. All right. So when you're researching those different SAT scores, you can get that information by visiting the college's website directly. You can also take a look at Navient Student to see how you stack up against different admissions policies and requirements. Parents and guardians do have access to Navians. Your student can log in with their username and password that they use to log into this computer zone, their schools. For parents and guardians, when you log into PowerSchool, you'll see this uh, small arrow in the top right corner of your screen when you click that you'll see that you can log into Family Connection. When you click that, you should be able to choose your student and then see what their Navient screen looks like. You're able to see what colleges or universities your student has marked as something that they're interested in. You're able to see their college application process because we use Navient Student for our seniors to apply to colleges and send transcripts. You have view only mode as a parent or guardian. You're, can suggest colleges for your student, but you're not able to complete the application process. Your student needs to do that through their login. And when you get into Navient Student, you have a chance to research different colleges, click and save colleges that you're interested in. And then we upload data, or our data syncs with PowerSchool and Navient. So Navient's knows your students' current SAT and PSAT scores as well as their GPA. And they're able to suggest different colleges or universities that may be a good fit for your student's profile that they have in the system. So it's a neat way for you to maybe consider colleges or universities that you're, you're not familiar with because a family member didn't attend it, but it may be a good fit. And you can click on it and research it right from this screen. Another tool in Navient Student is College Compare. And you can compare yourself to different college admissions requirements. This is a test student, Wildcat, that I have in the system. You see Wyatt's GPA is a 3.5. Their SAT score is actually in the wrong spot, but a 1030 and we see their PSAT score and their ACT score, and we see how it stacks up to Wyatt's selected schools that he's interested in. So Bowling Green matches the GPA requirement, matches the or at or above the ACT requirement, so that may be a good fit. University of Cincinnati, though, not matching with the GPA or the ACT or SAT, so that may be a reach school, or you may 
why it might want to consider retaking the assessment. Last tool I want to share with you in Navient Student is our scattergrams. And what's neat about this tool is it shows where you land in regards to your SAT, ACT scores, and GPA compared to students in Westerville who have applied and been accepted or denied to that school that you're interested in. So this is Wyatt's Bowling Green scattergram. And you can see the blue circle here is where Wyatt sits with his GPA and SAT score. And you can see those green checks are students that have been, um, who have applied and admit, been admitted to Bowling Green from Westerville. So you can see that Wyatt has a good chance of being admitted to Bowling Green. Uh, you'll see X's here of denied you know, this student had maybe a higher GPA. Again, it's your total profile and your a holistic application review that determines whether or not you're admitted. So this is just one piece of information, again, to help you understand how competitive you may be for a particular program. And then ACT, you can also toggle between SAT and ACT. We have a lot more data for ACT right now because typically that is what students took in Westerville before we started offering SAT to our juniors. And again, you'll see here that Wyatt's got a pretty strong profile compared to other students that have applied and been admitted to Bowling Green. Another tool that is a great one for your student to research different college options is Big Future. And you can sign, you can use your College Board account to sign in for this and share your SAT or ACT scores and save them. And you can pull up your college or university and then take a look at what the average SAT scores are or ACT scores and then how your scores compare and stack up and then look at the percent of freshmen that were admitted in those different score ranges. So for Wyatt, looking with meeting just the minimum benchmarks for SAT on the evidence-based reading and writing and math, see 10% of that freshman class had similar scores with the evidence-based and reading, right? So if it's based just on my scores alone, I don't have very competitive scores and my strength of application is going to be relying on other components instead of just my scores. The best way to prepare for a college readiness test is another question we often get. And the best way to prepare is to take challenging courses. To do well in your courses, prepare for tests and quizzes, ask and answer lots of questions and read a variety of materials and read often. That is the best way to prepare. There's certainly opportunity for you to hone your test taking skills and focus in on the format of the SAT or ACT, but it doesn't replace a solid preparation in your core academic classes. And those classes also are going to be leading to your strength of application and be showcasing your talents and skills, maybe even much more than a college admissions test. That being said, we, the opportunity to take a test multiple times does give you practice and familiarity with it. And oftentimes students who retake the test do see an increase in scores because you are more familiar with that. There are lots of free test prep resources for students to be able to do that. Ohio Means Jobs has an assessment practice that you can take. You can actually sign up for an account if you want to keep track of your scores or you can just log in and try it out. Khan Academy and ACT Academy I mentioned before, those two pieces take your test scores that you submit and really base your practice on those scores to help you gain additional points. And then Westerville Library hosts an ACT crash course. It's four hours, it is virtual now, and there's one in December 
that you can participate in. Again, free, it is offered by a company that also has a paid option as well that goes more in depth, but this may be a great place to start. If you are a student that is looking at a highly competitive program and wants to really stretch yourself for that particular high score, there are lots of private tutors and companies that will help you. Those prices range from, I've heard recently in Central Ohio, $90 to even $180 an hour. That's something to take a look at maybe after you've engaged the, the free resources and preparation that you have available to you. All right, with that, if there are any questions, feel free to ask those. You can also, if questions pop up later on, feel free to contact my office. My contact information is there. Your school counselor is also a fantastic resource. Please set up a meeting with them. They can walk through different college options with you. And I would love to have your feedback as we think about different programming for our college counselors to offer in this format. We love your feedback, not only about this content, but other content that you wish you had access to or that you would like to see future webinars on. So please go to that link there. You can also take your phone and scan the QR code to go right to the feedback link. And the link will also be available in the follow-up email that I will send out early this week, along with the presentation materials from today. So we will leave this up for a few more minutes and continue to monitor the Q&A box there. Thank you for joining us today and have a great afternoon.